opportunity to present uh, uh, some of our stuff here today. So, so the topic of my talk, as Josefine said, is lignin from a polymer synthetic perspective. And my name is Peter Olsen. Let's see if the changing of slide. Ah, now. Uh, so uh, uh, I work on functionalization strategies and polymer polymerization methodology development. So I only work partly, partly with lignin. And my main focus is, uh, I work as a researcher in the group of uh, Lars Berglund, where I do a lot on functionalization of biopolymers, sustainable chemistry, ring opening reactions, and also developing new polymerization methods and polymerization protocols. So uh, to, to visualize this, uh, I did uh, my, my PhD in, in, I would say, pure synthetic polymer chemistry followed by a, a postdoc in organic chemistry before I joined the group of Lars now roughly three years ago. So my, my understanding and, and my interest, I would say, is, is more, more lean towards uh, this synthetic part of uh, polymer science. So, of course, lignin is in many ways uh, a, a grand, uh, grand uh, challenge. And if I view this from a more polymer synthesis perspective. We always have this, uh, this I would say is my favorite book, uh, Principles of Polymerization by George Odian. Uh, and I would recommend everyone uh, to, to have this as a, as a summer read, uh, an amazing, amazing book. And if we look here at how the, the polymer properties, we can see here that the mechanical strength of, of a polymer is highly dependent on the molecular weight. But not only mechanical strength, we also strength. We also have the TD of the polymer, the, the melting temperature in a semi-crystalline polymer. Uh, what this value is is very dependent on the repeating unit of the polymer, but roughly in uh, in the vicinity of a molecular weight of uh, ten thousand. So if we start looking at this from the perspective of technical lignin, uh, this is just a, a representative structure because we cannot. We cannot really say exactly how the lignin stru structure looks because it's an assembly of very different uh, different molecules. Uh, in this case, lignin booster has a molecular weight of 2,400 and a dispersity of 7.9. We can see here if we look at uh, at this graph from Odian's principles of polymerization that we're way down here. So we are in the in the low oligomeric range. Uh, so we're not really reaching our poly polymeric properties of the lignin. Of course, this is an extremely dispersed system. So perhaps we will have some, some of these molecules that will approach this high molecular weight range. So, so what we need to do is that we need to design ways to upgrade the mo molecular weight somehow. And, and through this, we have different polymer synthetic concepts. We can either go uh, free radical, so we decorate uh, the lignin with some kind of function and handle, and then start a free radical polymerization process where the molecular weight will be independent on the conversion of the monomer, due to the fact that you have the initiation of a radical, it will propagate for a specific time period, and then transfer and kill or combine. Uh, the other approach, of course, we have is step growth uh, polymerization. So lignin has a lot of different functional handles, that we can condense together. Uh, at least for, for, for my perspective, the drawback here is uh, that the, this will create a cross-linked uh, polymer system. So making it really hard to, to know exactly what is happening from a pure synthetic perspective. The third, uh, third possibility we have is uh, addition polymerization, where you have some kind of initiating site on your polymer and then you grow your polymer consecutively. Uh, and this is, uh, is my, my favorite, uh, favorite uh, polymerization approach, where you can give a lot of control of the block configuration and, uh, and of the polymer chain. So if you think this uh, back from uh, our technical lignin, in this case, again, lignin boost, we have a lot of these different function handles. In particular, we have a lot of phenolics and aliphatic alcohols. And these aliphatic alcohols can be used, for example, as initiation sites for ring opening polymerization. 
And I really, really like ring open and polymerization. This was uh, one of my main focus areas when I did my PhD. And what is super important to, to think of when you do ring open and polymerization is that this is actually an equilibrium reaction. So, so if we go mechanistically, we have the nucleophile that open your heterocyclic ring and, and then you have the propagation starting here. But this would be an e equilibrium that will be dependent on the, on the system. How this equilibrium is shifted is very dependent on, on how the monomer stru structure lo looks like. So we concluded this uh, just after I finished my PhD in, in a perspective on, on how we should really think and, and pre-design our polymerization system to achieve the, the material properties we want. So this is the classical view on, on these different size lactones where we go from a four member that has very high polymerizability. A five member that is more or less impossible to polymerize under conventional conditions. So you need to go uh, very low in temperature. You need to have a polymerization mechanism that someone traps the growing chain end. Whereas the six member would be somewhere in the borderline. So we'd be very dependent on how the system is constructed uh, if it will go to a polymeric state or will reside in the monomeric state. And you have a seven member that is, uh, has very nice promisability. So what would be the ideal monomer to combine with lignin by, by having this, this uh, knowledge in, our, uh, in the back of our head? So uh, these different monomers can be visualized uh, through these graphs instead, where the green zone is the go-to zone where the yellow is, is, is borderline type of monomers and the red zone is, is impossible to polymerize under conventional conditions. So you can see here, if we, if we run the polymerization in bulk, we have a lot of different possible monomers to, to use. However, as soon as we start to dilute the system, the entropic contribution will, will, uh, will increase significantly, leaving just a few monomer members that make sense. So you have this seven membered uh, uh, ring here that is derived from, uh, uh, that you, we need to synthesize in the lab. Whereas this seven membered ring is commercially available uh, and is, a very, at least in my mind, a very, very nice, uh, nice monomer. So this is uh, caprolactone and polycaprolactone is semi-crystalline. It has uh, a melting temperature around 60 degrees, a TG of minus 60. It's not the strongest polymer ever. It has a tensile strength of 60 megapascal and a modulus of 0 0.4. But, uh, but of course, we were not the first by far to, to realize that the caprolactone is an, is an excellent uh, monomer to combine with lignin from a thermodynamic perspective. So this is uh, from uh, the seminar work by Wolf van uh, Glasser, and I was very, very interesting in, of understanding which type of catalytic system they used. So in this case, they use Stannis Octoate uh, 94, but they are also more recent uh, example where they used an organic catalyst uh, or, or zinc chloride, and even examples where they use uh, uh, lig the lignin backbone as a catalyst for the, the polymerization. But if we look more into the details, the, the outcome of this polymerization, we only achieved a very low molecular weight of the, of the lignin copolymer. And the reason, of course, here is that on, on the lignin backbone, you have a lot of different functional groups that will initiate polymerization. So if you want to reach a high molecular weight range of the copolymer, you can perhaps only use a 1-2% of lignin, which, at least in my mind, doesn't make sense anymore, then it's not really a lignin-based material. So to, to solve this, and if we want to do addition polymerization from our lignin backbone, we need to create functional ligomers. But these functional ligomers, uh, if we want to add a function, this must also be a ligomers that is, is reasonably costly so to be combined with technical lignin. So during my PhD, I did this, uh, developed this synthetic protocol where we go from D2 carbonate, combine this with uh, this uh, functional diol. We do a, a condensation polymerization in the first step, just an oligomerization. Then we increase the temperature. And due to the fact that this thermodynamic properties of this, uh, this monomer is at these temperature more favored toward the monomer side, 
we could selectively selectively remove the monomer from from the system. Uh, it turned out after a lot of struggling that in order to achieve a very uh, a, a very convenient depolymerization, the repeating unit uh, structure needs to be very coherent. So we need to be very careful when we perform these uh, these condensations. Uh, but the, the end product was a, a very very pure monomer. But in the context of combining this, uh, this uh, with lignin, this would be the ideal candidate. It's, it's, it's a sustainable pathway, it's, it's cheap, and we could easily make this uh, above 100 grams in the lab. But of course, in order to be a functional ligomer, it should also be able, we should also be able to use this function. So we explore this uh, with the uh, uv triggered cyrolene uh, click uh, chemistry. Where we added this uh, this silo group to the backbone, and uh, and uh, the prerequisite for for this polymer is of course that it, we don't have any fragmentation of the polymer chain when we do this. Otherwise, uh, otherwise there would be we could never control the reaction. And if we can see here this graph, we have the molecular weight of the polymer polymer chain, and we start here, uh, and then you see the conver conversion or or, or of the allyl group, you can see that it's a linear relationship with the conversion. So this uh, indicates to us that under these conditions, the, the polymer chain is, is intact and we actually only modify, modify the backbone. But again, we have to really consider the equilibrium behavior here. So, so the feature that made this, this uh, uh, Polymers uh, so, or this monomer so easily synthesized in the lab was, as I said, the equilibrium tendency. So if we look here on this graph where we have the monomer concentration on the left side and the polymer concentration uh, on the right side, as you increase the temperature and you reach above uh, 200 degrees, you have actually more monomer in the system than polymer. And this property is also affected by the concentrations. So if you approach here near bulk concentration, you can achieve a high conversion of your monomer to polymer, but as soon as you start to dilute it, uh, uh, dilute it, then you start to reform the monomer back again. So the way to solve this is, of course, uh, of course, copolymerization. By copolymerization, you can trap the monomer within your growing backbone, and it will not be affected that much by either the concentration or the temperature. So the question is, of course, uh, how should we copolymerize this? So if we look at uh, uh, an ionic copolymerization between uh, caprolactone and this uh, functional carbonate monomer, we can see that in, in the beginning, uh, here, here is TBD, was the catalyst of 30 degrees. In the beginning, we have very fast conversion of a carbonate and a slow conversion of a caprolactone. Uh, in this project, we this enable loss, uh, but this, of course, this propagation will be highly dependent on the on the temperature of the system. In this case, using really low temperature enabled us to, to do this very elegant uh, multi-block copolymer at very short reactions time, but just cycling between 30 degrees minus 40, 30 minus 40, back and forth, back and forth. But of course, this is not what we want to explore with lignin. We need to have a system that work uh, preferably at room temperature uh, uh, and gives the desired copolymer structure. So if we think this from the perspective of how it would initiate from the lignin backbone, we would create a copolymer structure that looks like this. So first you have the, your, your functional carbonate that we call uh, polymerize, followed by the caprolactone. If the next step when we have this functional uh, oligomers will be a cross-linking reaction, this will not be very beneficial because the crowding will be very high. So it will probably lead to an uneven uh, cross-link network. However, if we start looking instead on the, on the compromisation behavior with the cationic, you can see this uh, metansulfonic uh, uh, acid that is, uh, in my mind, an, an excellent catalyst for, for this system. It's, uh, it's cheap, it's very selective, and it's extremely active at uh, low temperature. If we look here at the copolymerization behavior, just comparing it to the caprolactone with TMC, we actually get the reverse trend, where the caprolactone 
polymerize first, followed by the six-membered cyclic carbonate. And the same, uh, same uh, behavior, this low polymerization rate we have found with the other cationic catalyst and anaomic that would be this functional cyclic carbonate. So from the lignin backbone, combining uh, lignin with carbolactone and anaomic would give rise to this copolymer structure instead. We first have the polymerization of uh, your PCL, followed by the polymerization of, of omic. So with all this back, background knowledge uh, in, in our heads, we, we started designing the system uh, we wanted to combine with, uh, with lignans. So the polymerization setup is, is following. We want to use carbolactone together with omic and you use acidic uh, uh, cationic ring open polymerization where the first step you have an activation of the monomer and, in the, and uh, a nucleophilic attack from the lignin backbone. So, so, uh, so in uh, the VBS center, a lot of uh, work uh, mainly by Martin Lavocca uh, has been how to address the heterogeneity of lignin by uh, applying this di different green solvent uh, fractionation approach. We start with the uh, uh, ethyl acetate, ethanol, methanol, and acetone. And by doing this, you create different lignin populations with the, with the different molecular weight, but also different functionality distribution. So if you look at this graph, uh, as we go from uh, ethyl acetate fraction to methanol, we increase the number of aliphatic alcohols, whereas the, the aromatic alcohols will be uh, more or less uh, constant, but reduce uh, in, the, in the end acetone fraction. Uh, and if we go more in, into to detail, we can also see that uh, with fractionation, the beta O4 content uh, increase, but all, and also the uh, amount of condensed structure increase uh, in the first three fraction, where I have a small decrease uh, in the lowest fraction. So you get a more native like uh, uh, lignin, perhaps in the end. So so then we had the, the polymerization system at hand. We, we, we decided to proceed with the, with the methanol fraction of, uh, of lignin, mainly because uh, from, from a synthetic perspective. So methanol is a very common precipitation solvent for, for PCL and omic, making it quite nice to just run the polymerization, uh, uh, solvate it, and then precipitate it in methanol. So the, in effect, we would remove the, the lignin part that had not taken part in the reaction. We catalyzed this with methyl sulfonic acid to wait percent for 18 hours. And then after the polymerization, we kill it with TN. So if we look at this uh, different polymerization, this first one is just with pure, pure, pure PCL. Uh, uh, and we can see for all this polymerization, we achieved a very high, high conversion of the monomer. Uh, so if we look at the, the the composition before uh, before polymerization and after the precipitated uh, polymer, we can see that actually the lignin content increased in the polymer. And if we look at the more specific components, we can see the lignin content increased in all cases. However, the aomic content was lower in the final uh, final uh, copolymer compared to the initial loading. Uh, the reason for this is, of course, that this will be, uh, the omic will polymerize in the end of the polymerization, but the equilibrium tendency is not that favorable, so you will have an un, uh, so you start backbiting from the chain end. The yield of this was uh, seemed to be very dependent on the on the lignin content. So higher lignin content in your copolymerization system increase the yield. In the first case. Uh, the one with PCL, even though we only had 10 weight percent of lignin, had the highest yield. The reason for this relates to that is we become much more crystalline due to the PCL structure. So if we dig more into the details, the composition uh, and structure for these uh, degradable tap polymers, we can see here that uh, uh, the, so in, in all cases, the theoretical uh, molecular weight was uh, slightly higher. We could observe a slightly higher molecular weight from GPC, but not in the case of uh, the pure PCL copolymer. 
if we dig more into details in the structure with the help of Osmond, we could see here that uh, uh, that the carboxylic acid content increased in these uh, most in the PCL copolymers. Uh, so 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 back to the phosphorus. So the, the question is of course how does it initiate and and what what uh, functional group takes part in this uh, initiation in the polymerization. So this is the starting uh, methanol fraction of lignin where we have the the carboxylic acid region. You have the uh, aromatic uh, region, and here you have the aliphatic region. So after copolymerization with the PCL, we could see uh, we could see after in where the phosphor and all that we have only a clear distinct peak relating to only one type of the species, uh, signifying that we have a very clear initiation from the aliphatic alcohol. But we also had a very clear carboxylic acid peak. And the reason for this is that there's always water present in the system that would initiate polymerization. Uh, in addition, we also had a, a quite significant amount of aromatic uh, phenolics remaining in the system. Uh, and then we have to keep in mind here that the leaving content is only 15 weight percent here. So this is uh, underrepresentative of the actual amount. But if we we'll also look at these, uh, these uh, copolymer structures, we can say, uh, I was very happy to see that uh, here in the aliphatic range, we had a very, very different types of peaks. And this relates to what type of uh, monomer that is situated in the, uh, at the end group of the growing polymer chain. So this will be related to PCL end groups, but this will be related to OMEC end groups. But uh, and we also have a lower amount of water uh, or, or carboxylic acids in the system. But in all cases, we had uh, still a significant amount of phenolic structure. Yeah. So, so what we believe is the mechanistic background for this, even though the, the phenolics are sufficiently nucleophilic to start the polymerization, if we, if we form these types of, uh, of uh, uh, phenol esters, these will be much e more easily either hydrolyzed or transesterized. So we still have a lot of these structures left in the, in the systems compared to an aliphatic alcohol that would be more stable. So the takeaway measure, uh, message from this is of course that on the lignin backbone, the initiation behavior is very different uh, of, of the functional groups. Uh, to, to expand this a bit, uh, bit further and look at the generality of this chemical uh, modification. We selected to have all these different lignin fractions doing this uh, as a specific uh, ratio where we start with 20 weight percent of lignin, 60 percent weight percent of carbolacton and 20 percent uh, weight percent of this functional monomer and created this copolymer. Uh, here we also uh, copolymer and depending on the starting fraction we will have uh, the creation of very different type of star copolymers. So this structure of course Lignin, you can never really write the, the, a clear molecular structure. So I just represented this is in blobs uh, uh, at different structure. And this uh, copolymer is based on uh, what would be the statistical average of, of structure in that population. So if you have the ethanol ethyl acetate, you will have this free graft uh, star copolymer, whereas if you increase the molecular weight of your starting lignin backbone, you create these different types of copolymers. The, the big difference here between uh, the, the methanol fraction and the acetone fraction is that the grafting density between them will be very different. So performing this, uh, this uh, polymerization uh, setup and calculating the number of initiation sites per, per molecule. So this is just how the, the lignin looked before polymerization uh, in, uh, in chloral form. And then we performed the polymerization, we could see an increase in all cases in the molecular weight, but what also increased was uh, the dispersity. So, so even though we did this fractionation had more defined starting, uh, starting molecules, uh, we still created a quite dispersed system in the end. The, the beautiful thing, uh, Afterwards, but this was completely soluble in chloral in chloroform, at least according to our visual observation. 
Uh, from a property point of view, we're starting with this different uh, lignin fraction. After we started with this very beautiful brownish powder, and we obtained a black blob uh, after copolymerization. The TD was extremely low because it was dominated by, uh, due to the fact that we have much more PCL in the system and OMEC. But what we also could observe, even though they looked amorphous, was that we have uh, two different uh, melting temperatures in our copolymer. This melting temperature relates to the blockiness on, of the copolymerization. So, so in the beginning, you have a lot of PCL po polymerizing that will give these sequences uh, the ability to, to crystallize. And the, uh, the crystallinity based on the PCL phase was in the range of 15 to 20%. So as a demonstration of this functional uh, oligomer, we just did a thermal initiated thiolene uh, click reaction. And what we could observe here, if we compare the ethyl acetate fraction with the ethanol fraction was that in one case, we created a more rigid material, whereas in other case, we created a more soft material. And if we look back to our, our statistical uh, averaged uh, molecule, uh, in, in the ethyl acetate fraction, we would have these three arms. And whereas in the ethanol fraction, we have six arms and much more crowded environment. So our belief here is that uh, we create a more homogeneously cross-linked network compared to here due to accessibility reasons. But more, more, more insights is needed to really conclude this. Uh, uh, but, uh, but also a, a big question is what is actually happening to the lignin backbone after we do this uh, copolarization? So this uh, HSQC is just on the pure uh, uh, pure PCL copolymer. And the reason is that we don't want too much crowding from uh, the OMEC peaks. And what you can see here in the beginning, in the mesonol fact, you have a clear peaks of the beta 4, the beta 5, the beta beta. But after copolymerization, these peaks seem to be absent. And, and this means that the catalyst we, we use is, is a very strong catalyst. Uh, uh, is so, so strong that it starts to activate the, the lignin backbone and starts to fragment, uh, fragment the structure, making it really hard to really understand the details uh, of, of what is happening in, in the system. So, so the takeaway here is that the, uh, during this, this specific chemical modification, the lignin backbone was not fully chemically uh, inert. And this could, of course, be very good if, if we understand that as, as a pathway of uh, fragment uh, the lignin further during modification. But it also it, it can be bad because we really need to understand this if we want to create the lignin materials with both reproducible and predictable properties. So, so my future thoughts, uh, thoughts about, uh, about lignin is that uh, we need to really understand the, the difference in reactivity behavior on how does these different function groups on the lignin backbone initiate differently. Can we obtain a more similar reactivity to make it uh, easier to do this, uh, this, uh, these types of modification? And we really need to, to pinpoint what is actually happening to the, to the backbone when we do this type of chemical modifications. Uh, and then I just want to show some of our, our most recent stuff we've been doing in the lab. And that is based on uh, this uh, chemical modification of lignin with propylene carbonate. So a propylene carbonate is a very interesting building block due to the fact that it's uh, uh, depending on the, if it is a phenolic or on an aliphatic alcohol, it has very different reactivity behavior. So the phenolic al alcohol is sufficiently nucleophilic to lead to a uh, decarboxylated de product. And we looked into the details on this, uh, this reaction, looking what we, uh, what uh, temperature is needed, what catalyst is required to, uh, to, to make this transformation. And it turns out that we really need to go quite high, 140 degrees. Uh, and it is also beneficial to have water in the system to make this, uh, this modification. So these are some kinetics uh, on, on the chemical modification uh, on lignin. And this really pinpoints 
sometimes how painful it can be to work with lignin because in, in this each case you cannot just run uh, a pure NMR you have to at each point isolate uh, and and run a phosphor NMR so you have to start in big batch and take away a very big portion but if all this can be solved in a very nice way it is possible to transform in this case we did a sequenced uh, reaction that has not been published published yet when we started here is just a classical ligno boost in water and then we did a green synthetic cascade combining different type of modification and we could create this completely voluble water soluble lignin in the end so thank you for for your attention this was the presentation